So Happy New Year, everybody. This is the first video for Chapter 8, um, and we're going to continue talking about some stuff we talked about in Chapter 7, which is the idea of something called a random variable. So you saw notation sort of like this in Chapter 7 a lot, probably that x is less than 3, where x in this case is a random variable. And we learned in Chapter 7 that there's actually two types of random variables. There's discrete random variables and continuous random variables. But now I want to give us some more vocabulary to some specific kind of random variables. So, for example, there's actually a couple, when we talked about continuous random variables, we talked about normal random variables, where we could use normal CDF, right? Where, you know, where the picture uh, looked something like this, right? Um, there were certainly other types of, uh, so that's just normal. There were certainly other continuous random variables. Right? We looked at examples like this, right, or like this, or all sorts of different pictures. Um, but certainly there's that vocabulary word normal that you've gotten used to knowing that the normal means this. Well, the big thing in Chapter 8 is we're going to look at different vocabulary for types of discrete random variables. And the two types we're going to look at are binomial random variables and geometric random variables. And there are certainly going to be other ones we're not going to talk about that don't have names. But really, Section, uh, section 8.1 is all about binomial random variables and section 8.2 is all about geometric random variables. And these binomial is probably the most important one. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about binomial random variables. So then that brings up the first question, this is section 8.1, what is a binomial random variable? So there's actually a kind of a checklist where we can talk about what makes something a binomial random variable. And there's four things that go along with it. So let's just kind of talk about if x is a binomial random variable, what would be true about x? Well, the first thing is there's two possible outcomes, which we're going to call success and failure. And don't get too hung up on those two terms, success and failure, like, you know, one's positive, one's negative. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, like if someone's throwing a dart at a board, what's the probability they hit the bullseye? Well, in that case, you know, success would be hitting the bullseye, failure would be missing the bullseye. But we're also going to talk about, you know, a family has children, what's the probability they have eight children, what's the probability they have three boys? Well, in that case, we might define having a boy as a success, but don't think about that as kind of just positive or negative, right? We actually will do an example later on about someone getting in a car accident. We're going to define success as getting in a car accident. So we just use those terms, success and failure. Don't get too hung up on, like, one being positive and one being negative or any kind of connotation like that. The next uh, thing in the checklist is there's a fixed number of observations, which we're going to use this variable n to represent that. So, for example, you're throwing darts at a board, you're, you must throw 20 darts at the board, something like that. You know, a family has exactly eight children, something like that. Uh, the next third thing in the checklist is all observations are independent. We're going to, you know, in my dart example, every observation, every dart throw is independent of each other. Um, the gender of children are independent of each other, things like that. The fourth thing in the checklist is the probability of success, which we're going to call P, a new uh, kind of vocabulary thing, is the same for all observations, um, which sort of seems like it's like number three. If you throw a dart, isn't the probability of hitting the bullseye the same on each one? Well, probably, assuming you're not like getting better or something else like that. There are a few kind of contrived examples where uh, item number three and four are sort of different, where it could be independent. But then this is different. You know, for example, imagine I'm buying a lottery ticket every week. What's the probability that I, uh, you know, win the lottery three times or something like that? Well, winning the lottery one week is independent of the next week. But sometimes the way the lottery works is if more people buy tickets, um, the uh, probability of success changes. Um, so this is a case where the lottery example, if the pro if the probability changes week to week. You could imagine where week to week is independent of each other, yet it fails on condition number four. Um, so a couple of different examples. The typical example we're going to use throughout this is someone shooting free throws. You know, someone's going to shoot, I don't know, ten free throws. They make some percentage of free throws. What's the probability they make exactly four? Something like that. And there's lots of will be lots of homework questions on just is it or is it not binomial? Why or why not? Just quickly, sometimes we'll talk about things being approximately binomial. Let me kind of give you an example of that. Imagine uh, you're working at the uh, toll booth, um, like on the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's some cars have the fast pass, which is like, you know, it's the automated thing, and some people pay with cash. Um, well, there's some percentage of cars, let's say it's 20% of cars have a fast pass. Um, 
is it uh, and 15 cars go through, what's the probability exactly four have a fast pass? Well, technically, once one car has gone through, isn't there one less car in the world that has a fast pass? So technically, they're not really independent. But the reality is we're talking about so fewer cars. Your sample size, your population is so large compared to the sample size of 15 that in that case we would say, yes, technically they're not independent, but we can say it's approximately binomial because, yes, the probability of success does change a little bit, but it's really more or less the same for each one. It's, so sometimes we'll talk about things being the idea of kind of approximately independent related to what we talked about in the previous chapter. Okay, yikes. Now that we know that we can identify whether something is binomial or not, I want to teach you the formula for how to do these calculations, for how to do a binomial problem. And we're going to run through the kind of calculations quickly, and then we're going to talk about an example. Um, so the first thing you have to know is there's this thing called factorial, which is, here I've written 5 factorial. And I think most of you have seen this before, but 5 factorial just means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This is not the binomial formula. But the notation, the binomial form, is a little bit goofy, so I want to teach you these things first. So, you know, 8 factorial would be 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, then there's this thing down here, which is called the binomial coefficient. And we pronounce this as n choose k, which is something you may have seen before in Algebra 2 or Precalculus. So n choose k is the number of possible groups of k you can choose out of a larger group of n. You know, so for example, if I write uh, 10 choose 3, that's the number of groups of, let's say, 3 students I can pick out of a class of 10 students. And the reason I taught you the factorial up here is that here's the formula for n choose k, uh, which is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. You may have seen this on your calculator as, N, as NCR on your calculator. That may have been how you did it before, and we'll do an example of this in a second. Um, but re relate this back to what you probably learned about in probability in Algebra 2 or pre-calculus. Okay. Now, now that you know that, here is the binomial formula. Okay. The probability of that x, which is a random uh, binomial random variable, equals some specific number k, is n choose k, we just learned what that means, times p to the k, p is the probability of success, q is a new thing, q is just the probability of failure. So if there's a, let's say there's a 60% chance of success, p would be 0.6, q would be 0.4 to the n minus k. Um, that's a crazy formula. You'll be given you'll be given that formula on a test, and of course, where we're going with this is there's a way to do it in your calculator. But let's do one example first a long way. Okay, here's a very typical binomial example. Um, you've got a basketball player who is shooting 10 free throws. This particular basketball player is a pretty good free throw shooter. They make 80% of their free throws. Find the probability that this person makes exactly 7. Okay, so right here I've written the binomial formula, exactly what I wrote on the previous slide. Okay. Now in this case, I'm just plugging in what we know. K is the specific number you're looking for. So K is 7. So see, I just replaced K with 7. Okay. N is the total number of trials. Well, this person is shooting 10 free throws. So N is 10, and then again K is 7. P is the probability of success. Well, this person, we're defining success as making a free throw. So that's 80%. So when it was P is 0.8, again, K is uh, 7. Q right here is the probability of failure. Well, uh, if you make 80% of your free throws, then you miss 20% of them. So Q is 0.2 to the 3. So, all G, all you have to do is just calculate this, and that's the answer. Well, calculating that's a little bit of a pain, because first, you have to calculate, well, what is 10 choose 7? So again, you can do this on the calculator, but it helps you with the total long way. 10 choose 7 is 10 factorial over 7 factorial times 3 factorial. I've written all this out. Here's 10 factorial. Here's 7 factorial. Here's 3 factorial. Okay. The nice thing about this is you can actually do a lot of canceling because I can cancel all of this. That's 7 factorial cancels with all of that. And so notice what I'm left with then is just 
10 times 9 times 8 over 3 times 2 times 1, which if you multiply it out, you get 720 over 6, which ends up being 120. So I figured out now that this is just 120, so I wrote that down there. And now this formula just becomes 120, and then I'm doing this right here, which is this right here, this and this, and I get the answer, which is 0 0.2013. So there's about a 20% chance that if you shoot 10 free throws and you make 80% of them, you'll make exactly 7. Uh, fortunately, the calculator does it for you. Let's talk about that. So here's what you need to know about the way the calculator works. Um, there's a new feature on your calculator that we're going to look at. It's kind of right by normal CDF, although it's a little bit lower. It's, I think, A in that list, which is called binomial PDF. Okay? Um, the, P binomial, the binome stands for binomial. This stands for probability distribution fun function. Probability distribution function. And the way it works is it's always N, P, K where we know what n is, is the number of observations. p is the probability of success. And k is the desired number of successes. So in the example I just did on the previous slide, we could actually do it, oh my gosh, look how much easier this is. Binomial PDF, there were 10 free throws, you make 80% of them, you want to figure out, how you make 7, so it's 10 is N, uh, P is 0.8, K is 7, and you just get the exact same answer. The calculator does all that math that we did on the previous slide, and just cranks out the number, and you get this. Nice, huh?